Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to session C2, highlighting local mitigation projects. We'll be going from 3.30 to 5 if you're in central time zone. Um, and it's the last session of today. My name is Jen Davis. I am the SHMO for Minnesota, the State Hazard Mitigation Officer for Minnesota. Um, and today um, I'll be introducing our three speakers. And um, remember in Slideo, remember the thumbs up questions you really want answered. So use that tool that we have and, um, and we'll get rolling here. So the title of the first presentation we have is Forensics of Flood Evaluation in Sequoia Tree Creek, New York and Innovative Flood Mitigations. Our presenter is Steve Gannon of Ramble. Um, he is a knowledge expert, a technical manager at Ramble America, formerly known as OBG, where he leads the America's Hydrologic and Hydraulic Practice Group within the Water Infrastructure and Climate Division. Sean is responsible for developing solutions to water resource, stormwater management, and the flood risk and mitigation projects. He has a passion for the funding issues for I'm guessing for finding issues community facing when addressing flood risk and resiliency project implementation. He is also committed to addressing climate change factors and the repair, replacement, and modernization of infrastructure. Sean has participated in the New York Floodplain and Stormwater Managers Association since its founding as an ASFPM chapter in 2002. He currently serves on the New York Association Board as the Region 6 Director. He holds a master's in civil engineering from Norwich University. He's a registered PE in New York, New Jersey, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, and the CFM. He's also a diplomat, water resources engineer, a project management professional, and a certified professional hydrologist. That's a lot of acronyms after your name, Chris. Um, uh, sorry, Sean. Sean is an adjunct professor also in the civil engineering department at the State University of New York Polytechnic Institute where he teaches a senior elective in hydrology. Without further ado, we'll hand it over to uh, Sean. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to present at this year's ASFPM virtual conference. I would like to take a moment to introduce my co-presenters. Dr. Hintha Kandami from Ramble and Supervisor Sean Coletta from the Town of Whitestown. Today, we have a presentation on our forensics evaluation of a flood on Sequoia Creek. Hello everyone, I'm Town of Whitestown Supervisor Sean Coletta and I'm going to kick off the presentation with a brief history of the Sequoia Creek, as well as how our current mitigation efforts started. According to FEMA, there have been at least 17 significant floods along the Sequoia Creek, with the first in 1910 and the most recent on Halloween 2019. Flooding has occurred due to intense rainfall events, snow melt, and ice jams, in addition to natural causes, overdevelopment and outdated infrastructure, or bridges that need to be upsized, have contributed to flooding. The floods resulting from Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee prompted New York State to commission a flood hazard mitigation study of the Sequoia Creek. In 2016, with great support from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the Town of Whitestown submitted a grant application to New York State Empire State Development for funding to design and implement recommendations from the study. The town was ultimately awarded more than $300,000 in funding, and as they say, the rest is history. With the funding from New York State Empire State Development, the town contracted with Ramble to develop preliminary plans to construct a series of floodplain benches along the lower Sequoia Creek within the town. Each of the 11 proposed floodplain benches had independent along with collective benefit. Original plans were created with blinders on or developing ways to reduce flooding to the greatest extent possible without at least initially taking into consideration structures. As the town and Ramble were finishing its preliminary plans, the July 2017 flood occurred, arguably the most severe flood until the 2019 Halloween flood. However, as bad as the July 2017 flood was, it was the spark the town needed to bring local, county, state, and federal governments together to more seriously address the issue of repetitive flooding and flood loss. With plans already in hand, the town was able to convince larger governments to allocate significant funding for the construction of the first two floodplain benches at Dunham Manor Park, land owned by the town. The first two floodplain benches, or phase one of overall mitigation efforts, were completed in the summer of 2019. 
Here's a map showing all of the proposed floodplain bench locations. Benches L5 and L6 made up Phase 1. All of the other benches are either in Phase 3 or Phase 4. The town secured a $3.8 million hazard mitigation grant program grant through FEMA for Phase 3 and recently submitted a funding application to the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation for Phase 4. Phase 2, not depicted on this map, is an extension of the town's original plans. Phase 2 includes the construction of a floodplain bench downstream adjacent to the CSX Railroad Bridge in the village of Whitesboro and the installation of five additional culverts underneath the railroad embankment. Construction is scheduled to start next month. Here's a simple illustration of what a floodplain bench looks like. In short, a floodplain bench is created by removing earth material to provide more storage and surface area for floodwaters. And here's a photo of phase one at Dunham Manor Park. The floodplain bench filled with fresh plantings is to the left of the creek. As you can see, the bench widened the creek channel to create more storage. Flash forward to today and what started as the Sequoia Creek Channel and Floodplain Restoration Project has transformed into the Sequoia Creek Channel and Floodplain Restoration Program featuring four main components. One, mitigation or floodplain benches. Two, adaptation or the buyout of some residential repetitive flood loss properties in the village of Whitesboro. Three, infrastructure improvements or the upsizing of bridges and culverts. And four, floodplain management or smarter development. Our improvements in Whitestown have truly become a model for others to follow. Thank you, Supervisor Coletta, for that introduction to this Hoyt Creek Channel and Floodplain Restoration Program. Before we dive deeper, I wanted to take a minute and just look at an overview of the inundation areas. And we're looking at a 4% annual chance on the slides here. And we're doing that because the July 2017 event was statistically a 4% annual chance event. And this existing condition graphic shows basically what that was experienced. Significant flooding along the commercial corridor, uh, around the school, into the village, and into the, the residential areas. And if we flip over and we look at the proposed conditions, you'll see that the, the program would significantly reduce flooding by removing all the flooding in the commercial area, uh, reduce the flooding quite a bit over here in the area of the school. And if you could look closely, you would see that it reduces the, the flooding depth in the upper part of the village. As the supervisor mentioned, we built Project One first. And Project One was that piece that was in Dunham Manor Park. And that was chosen, right, because the community owned the land already and it avoided the land acquisition difficulty. So we're gonna dive a smidge into Project One so you can have an understanding of its impacts so that we can then talk about Project Two and talk about the forensic evaluation. Taking a quick look at project one a little deeper we have the outline of the bench here along dunham manor park we removed oh, 68 70 000 cubic yards of material in some locations we had up to a 20 foot cut at the southern end of the project footer flows up screen here we have a series of grade control structures uh, these are important channel has a lot of head cutting we also have a sewer line and some water lines crossing the project so we wanted to protect those assets by controlling the stream bed. Here in the middle, you can see project does exactly what we'd expect it to. It reduces the flooding in the immediate adjacent overbank area. And as you notice, we're looking at that 4% event again, because we're making comparisons to what was experienced by the community during the July 2017 flood. And finally, just look at stream power. Uh, the yellow colors are the ones we like. The reds are, are, are too aggressive. So you see we have a lot of power coming into the project. We're able to, to settle that power down. We like the, the greens and grays in the overbank. We like the, dark, the red, yellows in the oranges in the channel. Uh, and you can see that we got a, a couple of spots, right? But we have projects bounding it on either side. And our modeling indicates that when those projects are built, the stream power will begin to settle through the project area. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kandambi, who's gonna take us through the next several slides. This figure shows the CFD analysis we performed for the cross veins. The figure on the right shows the velocity pattern when the cross veins are not built to the correct elevations. And the figure on the left shows the velocity pattern when the cross veins are optimized and built to the correct elevations. The main purpose of the cross veins is to keep the erosion at minimum 
and divert any overflow in the flood bench back to the main channel. The diversion of flow from the flood bench back to the river is clearly seen in this figure with the streamlines. We clearly see the figure on the right where the cross veins are not built to the correct standard, does not divert flow properly as intended. Instead, they divert flow straight into the flood bench. The figure on the left shows the smooth transitioning of flow in the main channel and then also flow diversion from the flood bench back to the main channel. Even though this concept seems to be very simple and obvious, their effects are significant and can be very costly if they are not designed properly. In this figure, you see the shear stresses on the bottom figures imposed by the associated velocities shown on the top figures. We see that when the cross veins are not designed correctly, they impose more damage than without them. We could not have seen these results in this detail without doing a CFD analysis. Thank you, Ahintha. So let's do a quick overview of what Project 2 is, and then we'll be able to dive into the forensic evaluation. Project 2 is focused in the village of Whitesboro. It is intended to address the repetitive destructive flooding that those residents and businesses right in the village experience. And it's, it's targeted specifically uh, at those residents. So to get us orientated again quickly, Project 1 was up here at Dunham Manor Park. Project 2 is down here in the village of Whitesboro. Uh, specifically, the town has acquired a large parcel of land right here from the owner, and we've actually let and received bids for this project, and it will be under construction here shortly. So digging a bit deeper into Project 2 and its area, a little map to help us kind of locate ourselves. We're down here at 1. All right, and this is us here. And this hatched area is really the area we're really focusing on with this project. We've got a Riskini Boulevard here. We got Main Street here. And as part of the effort that went into this project, we actually had surveyors go out and survey the first floor elevation, the lowest adjacent grade, and the lowest point of entry on every structure within this hashed area. And that really helped us not only in the design of the project, but it turned out to be a great aid in our, our forensic evaluation that we're going to talk about shortly. So now that we know where Project 1 and Project 2 is, I want to talk to you about what prompted the forensic evaluation we're going to talk about next. And that was Halloween of 2019. On that evening, we received just an intense, intense extreme rainfall event, what we, our European colleagues call a cloudburst event. And we just got hammered. It was similar uh, statistically to the July 2017 event, a little bit larger, but the intensity of the storm and, and the quickness at which it flashed through the watershed caused a, a lot of damage within the community. And it really uh, made everybody stand up and say, not only do we have a flooding problem, you know, we need to understand better how these extreme events are impacting our community and our built infrastructure. And for reference, uh, Project 2 is being built right here in the bottom uh, right-hand corner of this slide. So just flipping our point of view for a minute, looking at this from uh, the south, looking north, the stream flows from south to north. And you can see here along a risk and evil of our, just this wave, this flood wave of muddy water and debris just washing down, and this would be Gardner Street, washing down through the community. The creek is over here, headed towards our, our Project 2 location. And you can just see that just the magnitude um, of the issue. And what really made the community and all of our partners, uh, the state and others, want to know, you know, why was this storm so much more damaging to the community? Is there a particular reason? Was it because it happened a certain way? Was it because uh, the storm intensity occurred uh, at a certain time? Was it because it was in the evening? You know, what about it was different than the July 2017 event, which statistically was just a little bit smaller than this event? We performed a 2D HECRAS unsteady state hydrodynamic analysis using the full Halloween storm hydrograph to understand the flooding. The figure shows the breakdown of critical flooding identified during the course of the storm at critical locations and shows how it propagated into the residential neighborhood. 
the simulation portrayed the story of the flooding very well. These figures show the intensity of the physical damage to the structures during the storm. In this figure, we see the level of inundation if we zoom into the damaged neighborhood in the simulation. If we take a longitudinal section cutting through the houses as shown, we can see the inundation of houses at its peak flood compared to their first floor flood elevation. Similar to the previous figures, note that many houses didn't flood their first flood elevation, but still experienced a severe damage. So if you take a closer look at the look at these houses, you can see the hydrostatic pressure differential on each house is significant due to the existing ground slope. Additionally, the flood retention time for these houses were about six hours, which is a significant amount of time. Therefore, the combination of hydrostatic pressure differential along with the prolonged flood retention time made additional damage to the structure on top of the debris impact during the flood. Therefore, to overcome and reduce the flood risk, the modeling team came up with a number of design alternatives that included more flood benches, bridge widenings, additional culverts, and flood walls. The effectiveness of each individual component was tested individually and separately for their efficiency. However, the alternatives are highly effective when combined with two or more alternatives together. For example, in this figure, you can see the reduction of flooding that can be achieved by combining the alternatives as shown in the figure. Alternatives two, three, four, and five together brings a significant amount of flood reduction as you see on your top figures. So thank you again, Ahintha. Here I just have a collage of some pictures to kind of help us just kind of put in perspective why this forensic evaluation was so important and why it is, is led to a program of community buyouts where the NRCS and the state of New York has gotten together and has put $20 million into purchasing residents, uh, those who are interested within the village of Whitesboro and helping relocate those people out of the floodplain so that we can give mother nature back more of its floodplain, uh, reduce the amount of damage and threat to loss of life and really um, help this community grow and rebuild. And as you just look along this collage, you can see, you know, damaged basements, collapsed foundations, uh, you know, clogged streams with debris, again, more images of the flooding. And it just brings into perspective why this overall floodplain and channel restoration program is so important and how much all the partners involved in this are working to improve the life. Well, thank you. What a great presentation. Um, I don't see any questions yet if I'm doing this right. So um, I just want to comment and say how important it is for uh, local community members to see when a disaster happens that they're not affected. I mean, nothing, nothing can out naysayers like that and be like, oh yeah, that's, that is a good idea. Especially um, elected politicians or elected officials when they, um, you know, the funding they had to spend on large projects like that um, and then the reduced damages, it's just, it's, it's an amazing tool. Um, to show. So, okay, thanks, Bill, for sending in a uh, uh, question. Bill asks, small communities often oppose buyouts due to perceived lack of tax revenues. How did the village overcome that? That's something I hear all the time. Thank you, Jen. I assume you can hear me just fine. <laughs> um, you know, actually, it was quite uh, over the five or six years we worked on this program, um, there was actually back during Irene and Lee, there actually was an offer for buyouts and the village actually turned it down. Uh, none of the residents uh, were interested. So I, I think at this time, it was just the fact that there were two very devastating floods within two years of each other that really kind of brought 
full attention to, to the issue and made them much more interested in having the in having the discussion about buyouts. So why is they're concerned about the, obviously that the revenue loss, they're also much more concerned about uh, you know loss of life. There were a couple of close calls in October and that really did it for them. So unfortunately, I guess it just had to be um, getting whacked twice and to bring them, bring them around. Um, I want to echo that. I, you know, people get disaster amnesia and they think it's the one in 100 year, you know, flood, even though it's totally not. Um, but having it happen twice has ended up, I think, being a good thing, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, um, and that was just the two open water floods. We had two ice jam floods in between each one. So there was yeah, one every year. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, no disaster amnesia there. So yeah. that probably helped sell the project. I think. Yes. Um, one other question. Um, can you define the term benches? Uh, benches? Flood benches? I assume we're, we're talking about. Yeah, so, you know, flood benches yep. as... Um, as the supervisor showed in that one little graphic is just basically, you know, in this watershed, they had filled in all the natural floodplain and uh, built uh, various structures over the years back when we thought we could engineer solutions to everything. And, you know, so we had to find some floodplain for, for this stream. It was head cutting. It was disconnecting from what little floodplain it had. So basically, you know, we, if, I always describe it this way to the public, if you went and stood in the stream, uh, before the project was built, uh, you know, the, the bank was at your head level. And after we finished, the bank was at your knee level. And, you know, it was just a, a, basically a large excavation to, to create a bunch of volume in the watershed to replace what was filled in to, to create uh, retail space. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, depending on regionally where you are, you know, in the Midwest, we, we wouldn't have to do that because we have a little more space, whereas the East Coast is more built out. It's, it's a very urbanized area over here in the East Coast. And, um, you know, it's um, very favoring nature-based solutions now here, uh, FEMA is, and, and our local environmental conservation group. So, you know, there was a lot of work on, uh, you know, uh, rock, uh, uh, root wads and other natural stream bank stabilization processes to create uh, aquatic habitat and and to restore wetlands as well. That yeah, awesome. That's good. Uh, two other great uh, questions. Um, great project comment and then question. Did you use the NRCS floodplain easement program at all? No. Um, you know, for for this, for the first couple of rounds, um, you know, the state of New York has has been um, the funding agency has put quite a bit of money into this restoration and in this area. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I know we have some HMGP funds and we're pursuing quite a bit more funds uh, for the next several rounds. I will have to note that one down. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. Uh, there's a lot of programs out there. It just depends on if it fits or not. Um, uh, this is another great question coming from Rebecca. What are the plans for maintenance? Is the idea to allow the system to have room to reach natural system equilibrium, or are there plans for some level of targeted maintenance or heavy maintenance? Well, it's funny. You know, the pro the, the project was originally designed to be relatively maintenance free. You know, um, the debris and stuff that we see would wash up onto the benches, and then the community could easily remove that over time. Um, we did. It's funny. It's the story is you know we had all that damage post. Uh, 2019 event just as we were finishing up the project so we actually have quite a bit of maintenance to do that was outside of our control um, but in general they're intended to be relatively maintenance free um, and you know just the woody debris and other materials to wash up on the bench and the community can easily remove them later so is there a schedule for that the local community um, annually, they do a annually the uh, the communities do a walkthrough with with the state environmental conservation and agree on what maintenance can be done. And most of the time, as I says, it's removing tree debris stuff that's washed up. Um, so they do do an annual walkthrough, and it's simple enough for the town DPW uh, crews to address. Very good. 
um, another question. Are you doing, or I guess they'd be doing any water quality monitoring to determine if water quality is being improved, maybe at the state level? Um, you know, there is, we have a, a larger study to look at water quality in the entire watershed, uh, more from a turbidity uh, issues and, and whatnot. Um, that is an outgrowth of this program um, that is just kind of getting started here in this past about eight months. So we'll see um, where it goes next. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be nice to see if they had historic current and then, you know, collecting data in the future to see if those natural systems um, were reducing any of the nitrates or any of the other. Yeah, water there is some uh, older information from the past that was collected uh, you know, back when we had a little more funding for those sort of programs. Sure. Um, another good question here from John is how engineered was the biological restoration as opposed to just letting the water flow and what grows grows? Well, we uh, are plant ecologists and, and whatnot chose some, some plantings and some CD2 that would be uh, native to the area um, that matched up with uh, what we had uh, removed to some extent. We also had some wetlands in the area. We recovered all that soil and replaced it uh, as we went. And it, it really is intended to give it a stabilized root base and have a nice steady um, strata and then basically let the water flow and let it grow after that. We didn't engineer it to death. <laughs> yep, good, good, good. Sounds like the perfect combination of engineering and natural function. Um, and then there's a question about dredging. Did you all do any dredging? We did have to remove a large sediment field in the creek to install the cross veins and establish, um, you know, stability in that stretch. But that that's it. Um, we just had one field we had to remove. And that was relatively okay. easy to get approved because we had a purpose. We were protecting the infrastructure that was there, the sewer and water. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, make room for the water. Get rid of the, the stuff that's in there that's not supposed to be. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. Oh, three more questions. All righty. Um, so is there a special levy to fund maintenance, or how is that funded? Um, I know, you know our local, your local partner is on, but. Yeah, you know, uh, Supervisor Coletta, unfortunately, has a, a day job and wasn't able to join us. But, um, you know, as I said, Currently, they're able to fund it out of their general fund. It's been relatively uh, inexpensive. As I said, you know, a couple of trees wash up now and again uh, from upstream that have to be cut up and removed. And that was a problem before the benches were built. Um, haven't experienced any serious maintenance issues. So, you know, and right now we're, we're hoping to drive it just from the general fund. Great. Um, a question from Kyle. How did you ensure you added floodplain storage and not just convey more water downstream faster? <laughs> well, we had a couple of constriction points of structures, which kind of helped uh, <laughs> with that situation. But, uh, you know, we did, uh, we ran these in a, you know, a 2D unsteady model. So we were able to, to look at, you know, the change in hydrograph and the performance, uh, the volume through the system. Good. Um, and then was there any historic preservation concerns for this project? Uh, it, we did have to do quite a bit of archaeological work, especially since we had a 20 foot cut. But as we, um, the whole area is in, the Sequoia Creek is a Native American name. So we have to go through the whole archaeological effort each time. Yep. So were they on site when you were dredging and things like that? Uh, we were able to do some test pits and some, some borings, which allowed us to uh, not have to have them on site. But we originally were scheduled to have archaeological ar an archaeologist on site during the excavation. That makes sense. Okay, last question slash comment. Rebecca Pfeiffer, who's asked some of these good questions, um, says she wishes we were in person. She'd love to talk to you. She's next door in Vermont. She's the NFIP coordinator, and it sounds like a great project and similar to the projects they're doing there. The forensic analysis was really an interesting piece. Great. So thank you. applause from, from your neighbor there. It was, a, it was great. Uh, it was great because it really did get that, that buyout program going. It really did kick that forward. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. 
So we're coming up on four o'clock for the next presentation here. And it looks like I get to introduce that if I can get to the right spot. Um, our second presenter or second presentation is entitled Development of a Joint Water Quality and Flood Mitigation Goal Driven Capital Improvement Program. Um, the lead presenter is David Croning. Um, he's the lead project manager for Charlotte Mecklenburg Stormwater Services. David has approximately 30 years of experience working on both water quality and flood mitigation projects in North Carolina. He's been involved in TMDL development, CIP project development, and flood mitigation planning and implementation. David is currently focused upon the integration of low cost flood sensors with flood risk tools to better to enable better flood response and post flood recovery. Um, so now we get to see the presentation. Questions after. Hello, my name is David Craning, and along with Tim Troutman, um, we've prepared uh, this presentation on development of a joint water quality and flood mitigation goal driven capital improvement program. Tim and I are both with uh, Charlotte Macberg Stormwater Services. And this presentation talks about our experiences over the past uh, year or so, um, really delving into um, uh, chain, mo moving our CIP program uh, to a goal-driven program. So what is a goal-driven CIP, you might ask? Well, to us, it's really a decision structure um, that is used to guide the selection and implementation of our capital projects, uh, provide performance feedback and communicate with citizens, leadership and elected officials. And um, as a preface, um, Charlotte Mecklenburg, at least with Tim and I, we're with Mecklenburg, Mecklenburg County portion of Charlotte Mecklenburg. We have two general categories of capital projects. We have flood mitigation projects where um, things like acquisition and demolition um, and in place techniques such as structure elevation and uh, flood proofing. Um, that's sort of one side of the shop. The other side of the shop is the water quality side. And really, the only only thing we have, the only tool we have available to us there is stream restoration, and that's largely because of the way the res responsibilities work in Charlotte Mecklenburg. Uh, we with Mec we at Mecklenburg County are responsible for the FEMA streams, um, whereas the cities, the city and the towns are responsible for the smaller streams and then the site level BMPs. So really, the only tool we have in our toolbox from a water quality perspective with the county is uh, is stream restoration. So making sense of goals in the strategic business plan. When we start, set out to, to devise a goal-driven CIP, uh, we looked at um, our programmatic goals and as well as um, countywide goals. I'll just go ahead and read the why, our why statement for stormwater. We are passionate about making our environment safe and healthy by reducing flood losses and improving water quality for all. And right in there, um, you know, mentions uh, flooding and water quality. So these are these are really two core elements that really are a focus for us at, uh, with stormwater. We also look to the county strategic business plan and specifically goal three to enhance uh, quality of life through environmental stewardship. And there's a couple of uh, objectives, reducing flood losses and improving water quality right within um, the strategic business plan for the county. And those really just um, fall right from our why statement. So this kind of gave a, you know, sort of the background to us, uh, for us to, to start development of our CIP as far as setting goals. I just want to define a few things I'm going to mention a couple of times. Flood risk score. This is, this is a, um, a Mecklenburg County um, metric that's used that where we provide a numeric score to all of the properties, uh, to, to all the flood prone buildings in Mecklenburg County. There's, there's probably more than 5,000 of them. It really ranges from less than 10 to 5,000. Ten, low, you know, lowest, ten, under 10 is lowest risk, over 5,000 is very high risk. So it's just a numeric score. You're gonna hear me uh, mention flood risk score. Increasing score means increasing risk. Um, residual flood, flood, flood risk, or we can also think of this as our stopping point. Um, it's important to know that we will not eliminate flood risk in our community. Um, we allow development in the floodplain and we allow redevelopment in the floodplain. And um, our flood risk will never go to zero. The residual flood risk, you can think of that as the point at which we're at, the flood risk is at a point we can live with in our community. 
Additionally, uh, the stream uh, serves or the stream restoration ranking system. Um, this is similar to the flood risk score. It's essentially a numeric score uh, that's assigned to all the FEMA streams in Mecklenburg County based upon the stream's ability to support aquatic life. And it ranges from the most impaired, which is less than 100, to more than 200 for the most healthy streams. Um, now, with SERS, it's sort of opposite of flood risk. Increasing SERS scores means more healthy or better versus increasing flood risk score means higher risk or worse. So just keep that in mind. Now we'll start out with the flood mitigation side of the shop. And we really do keep the, the funding separate between flood mitigation um, and water quality, although they do, they do merge and come together at points. And I'll, I'll have an example of that towards the end of the presentation. So to set future goals, we looked at our past performance. Program, the program started in 1999. We didn't have the flood risk, flood risk score developed at that point, but we went ahead and, and back calculated what it would be. And we estimate that there was an excess of a million points, a million flood risk points back in 1999 when we started the program. We intensively evaluated our, our flood mitigation from the past 10 years. We really focused on it. And you know the entities doing mitigation work, like us, Mecklenburg County, but also the city of Charlotte and pr private entities. So these two pie charts, they really um, culminate, uh, it's the culmination of, of that analysis of flood mitigation and, and uh, flood risk added over the last 10 years. On the left pie chart uh, in blue is the mitigation that was performed by Mecklenburg County, the group that I'm with. We mitigated about 170,000 points, but also the city of Charlotte mitigated about 11,600 points. And that was almost entirely due to sewer projects where they would acquire uh, flood prone property, not for flood mitigation, but so that they have um, access to their sewer lines, um, equipment lay down area or equipment and material lay down areas, um, regardless of what those uh, properties were purchased for, they did flood mitigation benefit. Now also private infill. Um, we have certain neighborhoods with floodplains that are very desirable. And we have a lot of private entities coming in buying older flood prone homes that are not compliant with our floodplain ordinances and they're, and they're tearing those houses down and replacing them with new compliance structures. So this, that 17,831 points is the removal of those structures of the old non-compliant structures. But if we look over on the pie chart on the right, those, those non-compliant structures were replaced with, with compliant structures. So essentially the 17,831 17, points was, was removed, but then it was put back. And then on the, on the chart on the right, the infill development, about 7,000 points were put back. So a net benefit of, of about 10,000 points. Um, but we also had new construction during the, the past 10 years that added about 5,300 points um, to the floodplain. So um, net of improvement overall, about 19,500 points per year. Kind of the takeaway is there, it's somewhat in balance, um, the amount of uh, uh, flood mitigation that's being performed by private entities and then the, and then, um, the amount that's, uh, that's being added by private entities. Um, really, changes to the flood risk pool have been variable over the last 20 years. Um, since the program started in about 99. And you can see the chart on the right, that's, that's what we developed when we looked and, and did this sort of uh, forensic analysis of the flood mitigation program. Um, and you can see that there's, it's in fits and starts. Uh, in particular, in 2008, 2009, we had a big drop in flood risk. That was when we acquired a, a, a very flood prone uh, multifamily apartment uh, complex, or at least part of the complex, and removed those structures from the floodplain. So there's a big, big drop during 2008, 2009, but you can see there were many years prior to that where we did minimal amount of flood mitigation. But so really it has been in fits and starts. Um, another important message that I mentioned earlier, uh, private mitigation and development are essentially equal. It's, it's at, basically at, at a balance. Um, and the city of Charlotte is a steady contributor to flood mitigation. When we look back and, and thought about moving forward um, for, with the flood mitigation program, we really tried to match um, the level of flood risk that's consistent with our community values. 
Like I mentioned earlier, we allow development and redevelopment in the floodplain. Our risk will not go to zero. We value open space, including greenways. Usually, and these greenways um, in Mecklenburg County are usually located adjacent to our creeks. Um, a lot of property that we've acquired for flood mitigation purposes ultimately ends up being used for greenways. Um, so that's something that sort of an ancillary or extra benefit to, um, to the, the acquisition um, portion of our program. We don't have unlimited funding and we need to make difficult choices um, with regard to where our money is being spent. And the program is 100% voluntary. If someone tells us no, we will not condemn their property to do flood mitigation or water quality work. <clears throat> so matching the, the level of flood risk and these values, how, how do you do that? Well, in our case, we developed another metric we call the viability, viability metric, which was to match mitigation potential and costs with these community values. And essentially what it does is it looks at not only how is, is a particular mitigation technique, is it, is, it a, is it appropriate from an engineering perspective, but is, is it really viable? Obviously acquisition is, is, you know, will work everywhere, but is it really the best technique to use everywhere? And so we came up with some, some viability metrics that, that guided us through this process. And essentially for, for acquisition, um, we're not likely to purchase a, a house that costs more than $800,000, unless that house is extremely high flood risk and, um, and the cost per point reduced makes sense um, from, you know, with it being less than $1,200 per point re reduced. Similarly, with the in-place mitigation, um, we wanted to do, do projects that were really less than $125,000, or we will spend more than that, but only on those structures where it's extremely high risk or, or it's very effective from the amount of flood risk points reduced for the amount of money invested. Now, because of the value of our of open space, um, acquisition will win in a tie. Um, we, we kind of optimize this for acquisition. Um, our community values open space. We don't have enough of it. And it also helps our, our sister agencies um, with, like we said earlier, the, the, the sewer lines and um, the greenway construction. Establishing residual risk. So we looked at this viability metric and we had an optimized mitigation solution for each of the structures in the county, these 5,000 structures. We had a pre um, project score that we had calculated, and then we went ahead and calculated what the score would be post project. So we optimized every single um, structure, figured out in the end what what does uh, what does the risk pool look like for our community based upon the viability metrics I mentioned earlier, and that turned out to be about two hundred forty two thousand risk points because we knew the techniques that we were going to apply everywhere we could make a pretty, pretty reasonable cost estimate. And for us to reduce that, uh, that risk down to 242,000 points, we're looking at a cost of about $182 million. So what does that look like? Well, when we ran the viability estimates uh, for acquisition and in-place mitigation, um, we're, we were looking at about 582 buyouts at a total of 176 million to, um, to obtain the residual risk goals. And through that, we would mitigate it just over 300,000 points and $575 per point mitigated. Now, a lot of, there were a lot of other uh, in-place mitigation projects, a total of almost 500 of them. So roughly equal acquisition versus in-place mitigation projects. But those 487 mitigation projects were only estimated to cost $6 million. Uh, we're gonna mitigate a lot fewer points, right around 20,000 through that $6 million. But you'll notice that the cost per point mitigated is about half with in-place mitigation versus acquisition. And again, we, we, we sort of selected, pre-selected for acquisition because the county comes away with property that can be used for other, other uses. And so we're looking at about 1,100 projects, again, totaling about $182 million. Obviously, 182 is a, is a million is a big number. Um, and what, I, what I'm showing you here is just the each of those projects that I laid out on the graph in order of um, how much risk would be reduced versus how much the cumulative spend we had to do, to have to, had to, how much we had to expend to get there. And you can see that the right hand end of the chart there, the tail starts 
um, really the slope increases quickly. I mean, what that means is those are projects that are not as effective. You've got to spend a lot of money to, min, uh, to mitigate um, uh, relatively less risk. The projects on the left side of the curve, those are the cheaper projects where we're, we're mitigating a lot of risk for minor investment. And so at some point along this, this chart, we kind of had to pick an interim goal. And um, you know, there's no obviously obvious inflection point, but where the arrow is, is about where um, we um, opt optimize for with, the, with regard to our 10 to 15 year goal. So thinking about how we're going to fund this and how we're going to communicate this information to our elected officials and the citizens. Um, we looked at three different funding scenarios. So we, we looked at our current investment, which is about 2.6 million annually, a moderate investment of just over 5 million, significant investment of 8 million. And we utilized the uh, estimated project costs that we, we developed with, within the viability metric uh, framework and this annual investment to chart a length of time how long is it going to take us to get to that residual risk number? Projects were ordered based upon addressing highest risk first. So with this chart, in green here, this is the historical mitigation program. And then here are the three funding levels um, that we, we presented. And down here is our residual rip flood risk, uh, that 242,000 points. And you can see that our significant investment gets us there very quickly. In fact, in about 15 years, we'll be very, very close to residual risk. However, you can see that there's a, there's a pretty good break in the slope. And after the first 15 years of projects, the next grouping of projects is gonna be much more expensive to implement at a low, much uh, lower uh, flood risk reduction. And that's similar for the modest and current investment. They'll take a lot longer, but you know, we still see that's kind of similar break in slope. And I really focused in on the, uh, that significant investment on this slide. And you can see that, that after the you know, next four or five years, um, we, we anticipate um, a real a break in that slope where the projects are gonna start having diminishing returns um, for, for, uh, for equal investment. So um, you know, that's really what I'm trying to show. And this graph just shows the previous 10 years on the left of the blue line and the next 10 years to the right of the line. Um, in the previous 10 years, we mitigated right around 200,000 points. And over the next 10 years, we hope to be able to mitigate about 236,000 points. However, um, that's with a, with a funding increase of nearly four times. So we've done a really good job in the past of uh, identifying the highest risk, lowest cost projects and implementing them. But uh, now is where, the, now it's where things get tough and um, the projects are not quite we don't have that return on investment we once did. And that's just, you know, having a mature program. And then looking out, this is the breakdown of the projects. Acquisition still dominant, but we, and we have some FEMA grants that we're actually laying out um, the next four years with, but in place mitigation, private mitigation and total risk mitigated. That just shows the breakdown of the different categorization of the flood mitigation projects. All right. Now I'm gonna move over to the water quality CIP. So you, I mentioned SIRS, the Stream Restoration Ranking System. Again, it's a numeric value um, assigned to a stream based upon biological and geomorphic conditions, ranges from zero to 300. The higher the score, the better. We think that streams with scores above uh, 230 are, they, they are they're good. They're, they're supporting their designated uses. Streams with scores between 190 and 230 are okay. They're partially supporting. Uh, whereas scores below 150 are considered degraded and below 100 are severely degraded. So those are our most uh, challenged streams. Really with this slide, I'm just um, talking about the background of SERS. SERS was based on Will Harmon's functional pyramid. It includes hydrology, hydraulic, geomorphology, physiochemical, and biological indicators. So SIRS is, is a in the SIRS protocol is a is a field-based protocol and it's extremely labor intensive, takes days to implement and is very time consuming um, to collect. Um, it's really not practical to assess the entire county at one time. We have roughly 360 miles. Um, we can maybe do 10 miles a year. So if we waited till everything to be properly assessed in the field, 
you know, we're looking at, you know, in excess of 30 years to do that kind of assessment. We developed a surrogate desktop analysis where geomorphology was estimated from FEMA cross sections, water quality and biological community and habitat were estimated both from uh, nearby uh, monitoring and collection sites. And we normalize those scores to 300 to somewhat mimic the field scores. Just trying to get things into the right quartile to give us some indicator of what's going on out there. Um, we ended up assessing 308 discrete reaches spanning about 360 miles and, uh, and scoring all of those using this desktop um, surrogate analysis. So um, what, we, what we came up with um, are, you know, it's essentially shown in the pie chart. So that's these 360 or so miles of stream. So the goal attained, we have about 50, 50 miles of stream where we, we think are good in their current state. They just need to be preserved. We have another 50 where we've done projects and we know that the, the, the scores are, are good and our project in general is successful. And then we have another about 12 miles in progress um, down there in uh, the, that constraint um, slice. Um, we have about 30 miles we know we're never going to build. Uh, those are streams that are in the median of, of in the interstate or, or go on below beneath the interstate. They're at treatment plants um, or the drainage area is just too large um, for us to really apply stream restoration uh, techniques effectively. So, you know, there's some constraint that's preventing us from building. So what that leaves us is about 220 miles of stream that we probably need to work with. Those are, those are streams with scores below 190. So how much does it, would this cost? In 2020 money, we were looking at about $500 million to address that um, 220 miles of stream. If you look at 20 to 30 years of inflation, that's more than a billion dollars, which is, which is too big of a bite. We can't, that, that's impossible for us to, to really effectively manage and, and, and um, you know, communicate to, to our elected officials and leadership. That, that's a very, very big number. So that's using two point, about $2.4 million a mile. And unfortunately, there's no real way to optimize this. Um, it costs us nearly the same to move a stream with a score of 189 to a 90 as they are to move up to a, from a 90 to a 190. And that's because it's restoration. And, and really, for us to restore, effectively restore streams, we're talking about $2.4 million per mile, really kind of regardless of condition. So it became obvious that 190 as a line in the sand is, is really kind of unrealistic for us. So we, we started thinking through what residual risk or residual um, uh, water quality would look like. We really had to think through how good or bad is good enough. <clears throat> we are a rapidly urbanizing community and it probably makes sense that if we can just hold the line um, on a lot of these streams when things don't get, not getting worse, that's probably success. Um, we also thought about our stormwater control requirements and not, whether or not they're good enough. We have, we have detention and water quality requirements for all new development. Um, some communities require LID, others encourage it. We do have strict buffer requirements. So we're hopeful that, that the conditions are not going to get worse um, for, for our streams. Um, will marginal streams continue to degrade? Well, we hope not. Um, and that's something we're really keeping an eye on. But but to, to really focus in on, on where we can do the most good, uh, we decided that we would focus on the worst streams first and hope new uh, lower cost techniques are developed in the future to address some of these more, more marginal streams. We hope we can add more tools to the toolbox um, to, to really address those streams that are you know, 170 to, to do less than stream restoration and still get the uplift we need to, to get them over 190. Again, we decided to focus on the severely degraded streams first, those with surge scores below 150. So basically what that means is the water quality residual is streams between 150 and 190. And that resulted in about 100 future projects totaling about 286 million, which is still a lot of money, probably too much more money than um, we can legitimately go to our elected officials for, even over a 15 year time span. So we looked at various funding scenarios and tried to equate a funding scenario with change on the ground, assuming we, we, we address the uh, worst streams first. So 
at our current level of investment, which is also 2.6 million matches uh, the flood mitigation side, we can address all streams of SIR scores less than 110 in the next 10 years, only those most severely graded. If we roughly double that, we can only address streams um, with scores below 117. Whereas if we look at uh, increasing by about four times, um, we can address the streams, um, get, get all the streams in the county, essentially up to 130 over the next 10 years. And so what that looks like um, for, for the water quality side, and this is a similar chart to uh, what I presented for uh, flood mitigation, um, is with that significant investment, that 10 plus million dollars per year, we will have, <clears throat> excuse me, addressed all of the streams we've gotten, we will get all of the streams in the county up to that magical 150 number. The moderate investment takes, will take us till about 2075, and that current investment is gonna take us to the end of the century to really get all those streams up to that bare minimum residual uh, water quality level. So by defining an endpoint and uh, several funding scenarios to achieve the goal, we were able to present the alternatives to advisor groups and ultimately elected officials. Um, that significant increase funding scenario for both actually water quality and flood mitigation has been presented to our manager's office and, and our board and our, we expect a uh, final vote um, this summer in 2021. Partnerships. The one ancillary benefit of developing a goal-driven CIP is our ability to use the information to, to, to work more effectively with our, with our partners. Um, in particular, I'll, I'll bring up a Little Hope Creek um, sewer relief project. Little Hope Creek is an area where we had done mitigation work a few years ago, and we were essentially finished mitigating. Charlotte Water, um, our water and wastewater utility figured out that they needed to upgrade sewer in, in the neighborhood as well. So they came to us and asked if we were interested in partnering um, on, on, some, on some additional acquisition projects that they needed for their, uh, for their sewer project. And what we were able to do was analyze those properties, look at the flood risk and the cost to mitigate, and basically offered a cost share with them uh, on those properties so that they get they got the property that they needed, we got the flood mitigation that we needed, but we kept our cost per point consistent with with sort of with the rest of the of the neighborhood. And you know it really presented us with a way to very logically um, discuss with our partners um, how we can cost share. And it sort of formed that, that foundation uh, of cost sharing for this project. Additionally, um, it allows us to uh, identify multi-objective projects, Kings Branch stream restoration. We have a bunch of um, high-risk flood, flood prone multifamily buildings located here. There's the floodplain and some of the floodways even touching some of those buildings. Um, really that was too expensive for us to acquire. Uh, it didn't make sense from an acquisition standpoint. Um, and so we looked at restoration. Well, there's a surf score of 120, but it's, it's not really scheduled. Uh, we're not scheduled to look at uh, streams with scores of 120 for about the next 10 years. However, we did, were able to secure uh, FEMA funding for, for restoration because through the restoration, we will be able to actually drop flood elevations enough to pull all those multifamily buildings out of the floodplain. It's a very strange situation here. Uh, we have an adverse slope to the channel and um, we can address that through stream restoration. So we can get the flood mitigation benefit, we get the water quality benefit and um, you know, achieve those uh, multi-objectives. In conclusion, um, development of the goal-driven CIP um, is, it allows to translate high-level goals and business plan metrics um, for flood mitigation and water quality. Then it'll lay out costs, then it'll lay out um, timeframes and um, develop goals for, for our program for the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, and we were able to use that to present back to leadership and elected officials. And we'll find out this summer how good a job we did. Uh, it's important for me to also mention all project work is voluntary. Education of the public is a cr critical element of success. And that's another I issue with, the, uh, with developing a goal-driven CIP. Um, both, you know, people tell us no all the time. So that, that plan will, will, there's no way we're going to implement it 100% as written. Um, but at least it gives us a tool to educate and work with the public, especially from the water quality side, 
um, where we really need to, we really work with the citizens, um, not just as stakeholders, but as partners, because we're working on their property much of the time. And really the goal-driven CIP allows us to leverage partnerships, accomplish multiple objectives and work um, with, our, with our partners. So that's it for the presentation. Um, thank you. And we'll be happy to take some questions. All right. Thank you for that, David. That's quite a comprehensive program you got going there. That's that's very. Um, we only have time for one um, question, and we have a real few. Um, it is: Is your flood risk mitigation model points of risk per structure, amounts of points mitigated per dollar per year? Is it based on a model of academic literature or professional practice, or is it custom made just for Charlotte Mecklenburg? Um, Tim, I'll, I'll pass that question to you. Um, you were there for the development of that. Tim, you're uh, muted. All right. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. Yeah, it's a custom made. It's a combination of actually analyzing damage data and, and putting points to the associated damage as well as a stakeholder group that we put together where we went through a process to get their input, folks that lived in the floodplain as to um, what their perception and what they're most concerned about. And so the point system was developed around those two things. I got a message that said that uh, Jan Davis left. Joel Paulson, the executive director for the Metro Flood Diversion Authority. I'm here to talk to you today about implementing the largest flood protection public-private partnership project in the world. This project is located in Fargo, North Dakota, in Moorhead, Minnesota, right on the border between North Dakota and Minnesota, um, pretty much central to the Red River Basin, um, which you can see highlighted here. Um, the Red River Basin flows north into Lake Winnipeg and eventually into the Hudson Bay. Um, and, and that presents a number of challenges. Uh, the geography of the region is generally flat within the valley um, of the Red River. Uh, and there's numerous tributaries uh, that uh, that drain, uh, you know, significant amount of area. Uh, a north flowing river obviously um, has challenges in the spring during thawing, and uh, and what we see is, uh, you know, potential for ice jams um, and uh, um, as the basin uh, thaws from the south to the north. The, and, and that, in combination with the uh, the flat topography, uh, really creates a number of flood risk challenges for the Red River Valley. We've known for quite some time, um, you know, that we live in an area prone to flood risk. Uh, um, you can see some of these pictures back from the late 1800s in the mid 1900s of, of significant flood events that have occurred within the Fargo community. Um, so we've been challenged with uh, with fighting the springtime flood events as they come up. And over the years, we have begun to implement flood protection projects with levees and flood walls and pump stations. Um, but it really wasn't until the flood event of 2009 that was kind of a wake up call for the community. It was a record flood, uh, a, a level that we had never seen uh, in recorded history. Um, it impacted the, the community and, and residences and businesses that were located along the, uh, the perimeter of the river that couldn't be protected. Um, by and large, we were successful in protecting the Fargo community, um, but it wasn't without a significant effort. Over 7 million sandbags were, um, were filled and deployed during that flood event. And here's a picture you can see it was done entirely with volunteer labor. Um, the National Guard was brought in. Um, the 
Corps of Engineers. Uh, and uh, it, it was really uh, quite a war zone here in Fargo in order to um, shore up all the temporary flood protection that was necessary um, to hold back the, the waters of the Red River. So the call to action after 2009 was, was quite strong. Um, the local communities and counties that were impacted by that flood event um, decided that we can no longer um, um, continue to uh, risk the communities uh, knowing what we know and knowing that the water surface elevations continue to rise and uh, we continue to see uh, higher and higher frequency and higher and higher flood levels um, during the springtime flooding event. So the local communities galvanized around a straightforward project mission, basically provide 100 years certified flood protection as a minimum and the ability to fight a larger event. Uh, and, and we chose a 500 year fightable event. Um, and, and I talked a little bit earlier about the flood risk. And as you can see on this table, eight of the top 10 flood events have happened in the last 30 years. And uh, um, as floodplain managers, I think we all realize, uh, you know, what um, man has done to, um, to the drainage basins in the past and, and how we didn't have uh, the, the strong floodplain rules and regulations that we have now that helps to guide development in appropriate places. Um, and you, you can kind of see uh, uh, as well that the changing weather patterns are also playing a role into this. So we've done a lot of work to kind of understand why we are seeing larger flood events. Um, some of it is due to hydrology. Some of it is due to floodplain impacts uh, in the past that um, basically, um, you, you know, we see we see a larger peak flood events uh, as a result of that. Uh, we've done a lot of great work since that time and uh, you know, since the late 80s, mid 90s, as far as retention uh, projects and and uh, you know, developing away from the floodway and the floodplain. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is, it's so flat here that the floodplain spreads out. Um, you know, very far during some of these flood events and in events that we could see that are much higher than this, um, it, you know, would really basically flood out the entire Red River Valley and, and uh, all of the communities that are contained within it. So, so we knew we had to do something. So we moved forward with a local funding mechanism, which was a, a sales tax initiative. Uh, the local governments formed the diversion authority uh, in 2011 and expanded the powers in 2016. Uh, we hired a program management consultant um, to really start to look at how do we implement this permanent flood protection. Uh, and, it, uh, and, um, and, and we also started working with the Corps of Engineers. Uh, this is just a quick slide showing the governance structure of the authority. So it's made up of representatives from uh, communities and counties in Minnesota and North Dakota. So what was ultimately determined to, uh, to be the, um, the best project to implement to provide that 100 year certified flood protection for the the greater community of Fargo-Moorhead um, and, and some of the smaller ones contained on, on the outskirts was what is referred to as a diversion project. Um, and so this project contains uh, a diversion channel that's approximately 30 miles long um, and it, it bisects a number of rivers. Uh, and uh, we so we've had to implement aqueduct structures for two of the rivers. Uh, and a number of the other ones will uh, will intersect into the diversion channel and be routed back to the main stem of the Red River. Uh, and the diversion channel, really, the water is staged upstream in a, uh, a what we refer to as an upstream staging area. Uh, and that is done by the use of a, a dry dam so that the dam is only functioning during the flood events. Um, during the rest of the time, uh, it, the land use in the upstream area is uh, it will continue uh, with agricultural practices. The dam has three control structures, uh, one uh, inlet and control structure that uh, meters the amount of water that, that enters the diversion channel during the flood event. 
And then two control structures, uh, one on the Wild Rice River and one on the Red River. And that will really con control the staging of the water upstream until we get to the point that it starts to spill into the inlet and control structure and into the channel um, to route the excess uh, flood water safely around um, the community of West Fargo, Fargo and Moorhead. Uh, incidentally, um, I, I wanna note on this slide, there's also been um, uh, probably about 300 to $400 million worth of what we refer to as in-town levies and uh, flood control um, infrastructure that has been, uh, um, been worked on for the last 20 years. Those levees and flood walls will work in conjunction with the gate operation um, to ensure that the, the water stays within the banks. Uh, we don't have any certification issues uh, and we have and we maintain the proper freeboard uh, for the main stem of the Red River as it flows through the Fargo-Moorhead community. So this is just the, on the Fargo side, over $280 million has, has been put in place to date. Uh, 21 miles of protection has been uh, been placed. Here's a, a picture of the flood of 2013 to give folks a representative idea of what the temporary flood fighting effort looked like. This is a clay levy um, on the left of the screen. But uh, we also had uh, um, you know, miles, tens of miles of sandbag levees as well, um, and, and very challenging to place uh, and disruptive for the community um, you know, while the flood event is happening and uh, pre and post cleanup. In 2017, we completed this portion of the, of the in-town certified flood protection. You can see we moved the flood wall back away from the river uh, to allow more uh, natural floodplain to be used. Uh, actually move that road over to, uh, to, to the right of the screen as well. So FEMA accreditation, of course, is important for us. This is uh, the floodplain map on the Moorhead side or the, the, uh, the east side of the river in Minnesota. Um, so you can see the floodplain is, uh, you know, encompasses approximately a third of the community. Um, and those residents are, are currently uh, contained uh, within that flood risk zone. Uh, with the mandatory flood insurance risk requir requirements. Um, and this project uh, with the in-town components will uh, provide that certified level of flood protection. Um, so I, I also wanna talk a little bit about how we're delivering this project because I think it's very unique in nature. Uh, the size of the project is about, it's about a $3 billion program and which is a you know quite costly infrastructure project for the, just the local community to try to undertake. Um, and so we started to look at funding and, and other partners to, uh, to bring this project to fruition. And uh, we decided in July 11th, 2016, to uh, establish this as a public-private partnership um, portion of the project. And the core of engineers would deliver a portion of the project. And we refer to this as a split delivery. So basically on this screen, the dark blue uh, and the control structures that are indicated on the bottom of the map are being delivered through traditional design bid build um, contracts uh, that are being designed and executed by the, the US Corps of Engineers. Um, we felt it appropriate that the Corps take on um, some of the highest risk area. Uh, this is a high risk uh, dry dam. Um, and the control structures are, uh, are an integral part of uh, being able to control the flooding in the spring. Um, and so at the moment, the, uh, the Corps of Engineers is actively under construction at the, at, with the diversion inlet and control structure, the Wild Rice River control structure, uh, and, and a few components of the, uh, what we refer to as the Southern Embankment. The diversion authority um, is the other side of the split delivery. And we have committed to delivering the diversion channel, um, the 18 bridges associated with, with the crossings, the two aqueducts um, and uh, in the in-town levy work. And uh, you know, that's the channel and the associated structures are about a billion dollars. So it's still a very large uh, costly feature for uh, our local community to, uh, to support. So we decided to focus on a public-private partnership. 
And that allows us to bring in equity within the private market and create a long-term um, partnership with a private development contractor um, for 30 years. Uh, and and uh, they'll be responsible for designing, uh, building, and operating, and maintaining the diversion channel and the associated structures for 30 years. One of the advantages we get is uh, we get some certainty and costs as far as the design and the operation and maintenance up front before construction even starts. Um, and we can get all of our financing in place over the course of the next 30 years to um, support that repayment back to the to the private entity. This is one of the first. I think it is the first P3 uh, water supply pro or water protection project in uh, in the United States uh, today. I do think the Corps is working on implementing this same structure and concept uh, in a few other areas, uh, but those projects are just in the uh, the, the preliminary phases. Uh, we're the only one that is actively under construction. Um, and the timing of this conference is is uh, is kind of ideal. Um, we have received um, bids from a, a number of private development teams uh, for the uh, to deliver the diversion channel and the structures in one um, in one contract. And uh, you know we hope to be moving forward with the selection of uh, of the preferred proposer uh, within the next month in starting construction on uh, the diversion channel itself, um, possibly even as early as uh, the fall of 2021. Um, so just, uh, I talked a little bit about the course progress. Uh, here you can see what the inlet uh, for the diversion channel will look like. Um, it's a series of three gates uh, that are operated um, to meter the amount of water that enters the diversion channel and stage the water upstream. Here's a picture of the construction of the uh, of the inlet structure. Um, and so you can see the the wing walls and you can see the uh, the the pad for the uh, the location of where the gates will be located. Uh, the Corps is also um, in the middle of constructing the uh, Wild Rice River control structure, um, and this is uh, two 40-foot gates um, that will, uh, it's being built in the uh, in the dry right now of a river bend on the Wild Rice River. Uh, once the once the structure is complete, uh, the river will actually be rerouted through the structure, um, and, and, uh, and it'll be there to uh, provide that uh, control in staging of uh, water upstream of the Fargo-Moorhead community. So with this project, I think it's fairly unique as far as the footprint. Um, you know, we're dealing with uh, in total probably about 70,000 acre footprint when you take into account the, uh, the uh, flow easements necessary to um, mitigate the, uh, the, the higher water in the upstream area during certain uh, flood events as well as just the footprint for the infrastructure for the channel um, and the, the southern embankment. Um, and so we're about 350 parcels uh, acquired to date, um, about 50% of the land has been acquired uh, for the project. Um, certainly a, a, a huge effort on our lands program um, and that, that's moving forward fairly well. And the other component of the lands program is also the mitigation that is necessary for a project of this magnitude. Um, so you can see a number of key components on this slide. Uh, we've really done a lot of innovation as far as how to address the impacts for such a, a, a large impactful project and how to do it in, a, in an empathetic way and you know, taking into account our environmental impacts as well as our impacts, uh, our socioeconomic impacts on people that uh, need to be relocated out of the upstream mitigation area, um, as well as folks that need to be re relocated in town uh, for the in-town um, flood protection elements as well. So a, a few uh, interesting things that I think we innovated on this project um, were actually uh, included, um, you know, supplemental crop insurance 
policies for the producers that uh, that may be impacted by the staging of the water upstream. We've also um, will be implementing a insurance product uh, to uh, prevent plants. So if the producer can't plant their crops because of uh, the, the waters on their fields longer because of our project, uh, we will reimburse up to 100% uh, of the of the producer's losses. Um, but you know, ultimately, you know, when we put it into perspective. This project's only intended to um, be operated under extreme events. Um, during lesser flood events where the project does not operate, um, there's very small um, uh, and almost negligible impacts to, uh, to the river basin. And the structures will just continue to allow the water to flow down the, uh, down the uh, natural drainage path. It isn't until we get to that um, larger flood event, the 100-year flood events, where we're really utilizing the uh, the diversion channel, uh, and then it is being built um, ultimately to the uh, to the PMF event or the probable maximum flood event, which is somewhere around a 150,000 year uh, return um, interval, um, and and so the project itself is is built to withstand a you know a very robust uh, uh, flood event and and continue to allow the protection that we need but we spent a lot of time on the property rights and, and mitigation plan and it, that can be found on our website if uh, anyone's interested in um, looking into some of the unique programs that we set up so I want to talk a little bit about the public private partnership aspect and uh, how it's so unique for us, both on the funding and on the uh, the constructing construction side. So basically, the the process that we've gone through so far is we we shortlisted a number of P3 development teams, and uh, those teams then have now been working with us through a request for proposal process, um, and uh, they have submitted their technical proposals and their technical approaches of how they would construct. The diversion channel and the bridges and the aqueducts, and uh, what we what we can hope to get out of that process is really just innovation. So we got some of the world's largest uh, contracting and engineering companies that are partnering with local contractors and engineers, and um, they're really innovating uh, unique and efficient ways to construct this project. And um, and I think that's a huge benefit that you get out of. Uh, a public private partnership type project. The other huge benefit is that we get that cost certainty and we we know exactly how much the project's going to cost and how much the operation and maintenance is going to be long term. We are going into this though, however, with some contingencies uh, through the public private partnership. There's obviously some areas where there could be additional compensation events for the developer. Um, you know, given un unintended consequences related to, you know, maybe a, a flood event that occurs um, well, during construction or or such. Uh, but really, the P3 developers will bring their own equity and they will bring their own uh, financing to the table. Um, and then we will pay that back basically uh, in a series of milestone uh, payments during construction. And then over the course of the next 30 years through an operation and maintenance um, payment. So this this is just kind of a you know when we are going to make our initial milestone payments. So you can see with the P3 process, we actually won't be uh, making any payments uh, for the first few years of construction, which helps us to kind of sculpt our debt and our financing um, to be able to tackle such a such a large program. And then long term, you can see this is a combination of our debt service and the combination of a payback to the uh, private developer. Uh, the private developer will be here for the next 30 years and they'll be doing all the uh, all the maintenance um, necessary for the diversion channel and the associated infrastructure. And we'll be able to get those numbers up front. It's really a risk transfer on some of these things from a public entity over to a private entity that is also appealing in a public-private partnership. Um, so they're assuming the risk of maintenance for the next 30 years. A lot of times you do not get that uh, in a traditional delivery type of project. So uh, you know, another unique area is just 
the, the funding for the program. A typical Corps of Engineers project is funded at about a 65 to 70 percent level uh, by the federal government and a 30 percent level by the by the local or non-federal sponsor. For our program, um, we flip that on its head. Uh, and basically the federal government is in this uh, for about 35 percent of the costs and the local governments are funding um, you know, a majority of the program. And this is very important uh, policy perspective from the from the core and th they want to be able to get more flood control projects done just because of climate change and, and changes in the environment. Um, you know, we're seeing increasingly um, uh, more impactful hurricanes and flooding events on the coasts and the core has a backlog of uh, over, you know, 100 billion dollars worth of uh, work that's already been authorized. And in much more that needs to be done. So this type of a concept of reducing the federal share and being able to accomplish large flood control projects, even in relatively smaller mid-sized com communities like Fargo Moorhead, um, you know, are, it's an extremely important concept for them. And so they've really been using our project as a pilot for the P3 contracting mechanism to, to get best management practices and be able to bring those across the country. Um, to other large uh, flood control projects that could benefit from an arrangement such as ours. Uh, so I won't get into this too much, but uh, we are uh, also uh, acquiring an EPA WIFIA loan for about 569 million. That's really where our uh, debt, uh, that debt payment in that last graph that uh, showed is, is coming from. Um, and we have had about 330 or $313 million worth of federal dollars coming into the program already for the work that the core is doing. Um, so just a few lessons learned, you know, start early, de develop long-term champions. And we did that through the authority and, uh, and be flexible. Um, it's, a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And uh, we've been working on this program for about 10 years. So, so with that, um, you know, we'll open it up for the, uh, the question and answer session. Thank you. All right. Well, that is a very exciting and large project um, for the uh, Red River of the North um, in Minnesota and North Dakota. It's a pretty big deal. Um, us up here in the region are, are well aware of it. Um, so you'll have to thank Joel for us. Um, and to answer questions, we have Chris here with us. So um, a few of the questions we've gotten in so far are, um, what is the habitat loss by relocating the stream? Is that, I'm sure there was an EA done or EIS? Yeah, there were there were several environmental studies. The Corps of Engineers did the overall EIS for the project. Um, then they've done several supplemental EAs as well, along with uh, um, several state agencies have also done independent studies. Um, most of the land for the channel was being farmed today. So the overall habitat loss was mostly farmland. Um, there certainly was were some wetlands and some other localized items that we are dealing with, mostly mit able to mitigate right within the channel footprint. Um, we also are doing a couple of additional mitigation projects outside of the channel that, that also are compensating for the loss of the habitat as well. So. Great, yeah, um, my understanding is is, is it is mostly farmland and they farm right up to the edge so pretty not much. a lot of uh, habitat for much of anything um uh suzanne giovanni you may know her um says yep. you're utilizing staging area at the five percent or 20-year event um not that extreme so that that's her comment do you have anything to say yeah i, I think yeah, I think Joel's intent there is that at those smaller events, it would be a pretty small impact or footprint that we're utilizing. But yes, we are operating at around a little over a 20 year event is when we start operations. Um, our maximum pool occurs at a 500 year event. And then for extreme events, then there's some additional pool that we use only for those extreme events. So. So there's a pretty dramatic difference between a 20 year and a 100 year and a 500 year, but uh, Suzanne's correct. We, we are operating at, at somewhere between a 20 and 25 year event. 
I'm sure she's very familiar with the, the project. Yep. Um, Linda asks, how long will construction take? Um, right now, our schedule is to be completed with the project in by the end of 2027 and be able to be operational in 2028. So another one of the advantages of the P3 is there, uh, everything's packaged together. Uh, you know, of course, the core has been working for the last few years, so they're a little bit ahead of us. So while it takes them a little longer with their individual projects, um, we've aligned our schedules so that we can, our all on schedules be done at the end of 2027. Well, I'm sh shocked that there aren't any more questions. It is five o'clock, but um, I just wanted to thank you all again. And um, I think, you know, when we do the, the forensic evaluation of this in 2028 or whatever at this conference, um, that the, the public-private partnerships brought on some really innovative um, techniques, methods, something like that. So yeah, absolutely. Um, We'd be happy to come back anytime and share progress and certainly share forensics as we step more into operational roles than construction. So thanks a lot, Jim. Um, everybody, thank you for presenting. Thank you for attending. And um, we look forward to more and more mitigation pr best practices at this conference. So with that, see you virtually tomorrow and good night. Thank you.